Welcome everyone to today's devotion. We find ourselves in Romans chapter 8 in what is both the halfway point of uh, this epistle to the church in, in Rome. It is also perhaps the, the uh, most popular chapter in the book of Romans. Everyone who, who loves Romans probably has their own uh, chapter that they love the most, minus probably chapter 6. Um, but, but this is probably the one that's quoted the most, um, at least in terms of larger sections. And it's the one people seem to go back to the, the most. And what we need to see is, is, as we've argued, the first three chapters lays out the foundation of the, of the universality of sin. We're all guilty of sin, Jew or Gentile, male or female, uh, black or white, Republican, Democrat, or whatever, however we, we may uh, identify ourselves. We, uh, we, we are guilty and we stand condemned before God. Uh, chapters 4 and 5 looks, looks at the solution to the problem, and that is salvation found in Jesus Christ alone. Now, Paul uses the term justification by faith alone. That is to say that we stand before God, holy and righteous, condemned, yet because of the finished work of Christ, we are acquitted. We are counted as righteous, as, as he would say. Chapter 6 and 7 deals with what follows salvation, that is sanctification. That is uh, the, the progress by which the believer becomes more like Jesus. Um, contrary to popular thought, when a person surrenders and, and gives their uh, lives to Jesus, they don't suddenly um, become perfect. In fact, we'll never be perfect, um, uh, but, but um, uh, at least not in this world. Um, so, so Paul walks us through the two extremes of sanctification. One would be a, a libertarianism uh, that, that indulges the flesh. The other is religion, uh, which turns the gospel into rule-keeping. Uh, both extremes um, uh, rob us of actually living in freedom in Christ. Um, chapter 8 continues that conversation, so we're still talking about sanctification, uh, but he's much more specific. Um, if, if, if I were to, to, to use one word to for, in terms of, uh, uh, of a doctrine to describe chapter 8, I think the word would be adoption. The doctrine of adoption uh, deals with both justification, how we're saved, and sanctification. What does it mean to live as being saved? Um, but, but it isn't a general category like we get in chapter 6 and 7. Rather, he's much more specific. Because we are adopted, this, the, here's some practical points we have in our life. And one of the key themes of chapter 8 in the context of the doctrine of adoption, which is found in the middle of the chapter, is the issue of suffering. What does it mean to live as a believer amid suffering. So as you can imagine, this is a timely chapter considering our context, that, that we're still viewing this through uh, the medium of, of lockdown. Um, yes, restaurants are opening up. Yes, businesses are opening up. Yes, even our church is opening up. At the same time, the message we're hearing is, though the economy is opening up, stay away from people. Uh, uh, it is dangerous out there. Um, and, and we don't know what the future looks like in terms of our economy, our world, or anything like that. So this is a very timely chapter amid our current uh, crisis. Uh, but though it's about adoption, it's about adoption because it's about the gospel. Every chapter in Romans is about the gospel. Of course, I think every chapter of the Bible is ultimately ab about the gospel. So notice what he says about the gospel, and, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll bring in themes of adoption as, as it happens. First of all, the gospel sets us free. Notice how this chapter begins. In fact, if you were to pick one verse in this chapter to highlight, to memorize, I think verse 1 is, is a good option for that. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So simple and yet so profound and very practical. If you are in Christ, there is no condemnation over you. Nothing. So if you are condemning yourself, if you are living in anxiety and stress, uh, if you feel guilty and shame, then, then you do so unnecessarily because there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. If you're wanting more on this, if, if, if time would allow us, I, I, I would point you to the, tra the spiritual travails of Martin Luther, who, who constantly felt the, the pull 
of of accusation um, that that he was he was unworthy he was he was not not uh, g God couldn't use him and he's just a filthy sinner and all this sort of stuff he, he felt constantly these words of accusation upon him he would return back to Paul here in Romans 8 1 there is no condemnation of those who are in Christ Jesus none at all right and that is really a, cli a climax of everything we've seen in the first seven chapters isn't it Though we are guilty and we stand condemned, we are hidden in Christ who is making us like him. There is therefore no condemnation of those who are in Christ Jesus. But notice what else he says about the freedom we have in Christ. He says there in verse 2, For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Remember, everything he has said about the law, the law condemns, Christ redeems. That's his point, is that if all you're going to do is keep rules, what you're going to find is death in those rules. What you're going to find is bondage in those rules. But in Christ you find freedom. Verse 3, for God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, cannot do. Remember, we talked about this yesterday. That, that though there is a law, we, we can't keep it perfectly because of the flesh. Right? So, so what we'll do is the law may, may make our desire stronger. Remember, Dennis, the minister, you know, don't, don't push the, the button. Or, um, or it, it demonstrates our just inability to, to be perfect. What we need is a Savior. So God, uh, what has he done with the law? He's done what we could not do. By sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walked not according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. In other words, if, if the law demands perfection in order to be stand in the presence of God, and if we can't be perfect, what's the answer? We must find ourselves covered in the one who is perfect, one who will obey the law, who is like us in every way yet without sin. And when his righteousness is counted towards us, he stands as our substitute so that when God sees us, he doesn't see us as we really are. He sees us as Christ really is. We, we are clothed in his righteousness. We are then justified. And in justified, we're no longer condemned. So if the court of law finds you innocent of a crime, you're innocent of that crime, period. There is no condemnation over you. Verse 5, for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of flesh. See the sanctification application? So, so if your mind is, is on fleshly desires, then you are going to live and die by those desires. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. The Spirit is a major theme in chapter 8. Right? Because he says there, verse 8, those who, who are in the flesh cannot please God. So, so his big idea here is the gospel has set you free. Therefore, you are not constrained by the, the regulations of the law, nor are you constrained by the regulations of the flesh. You are free. You are free indeed. The gospel does this. Now, what religion wants you to do is to err on the side of ritual and rule keeping. What the world wants you to do is to err on the side of the flesh. Just be driven by your desires and thus dehumanize us. And what we saw in the last two days was those are really two sides of the same coin. The gospel and the gospel alone is good news in that it says you don't need to be a slave to either one. You are free in Christ. So not only does the gospel set us free, the gospel makes us alive. Death has been a major theme in the book of Romans. As, as bondage and slavery has, so is death. In that the law condemns us to death, right? So does our unrepentant desires. The wages of sin is death, he said at the end of chapter 6. Well, in verse 11, he says, If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. I just want to make a brief application here. I believe this application is not only eternal, the day will come when, when God will glorify our bodies and we will be embodied beings in heaven. So if you think heaven is us floating on the top of clouds as chubby cherubim with small wings, how those wings will carry such, such large babies, and then all we do is play harps, um, that's not right. right? I mean, you're not getting that from the Bible. Um, some dude made that up in order to sell uh, little porcelain dolls or something, I don't know. Um, right, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible describes 
a new creation, a new heavens, a new earth, a new Jerusalem, to where embodied beings, not disembodied, we're not just going to be spiritual beings, we are embodied beings, so we can touch and taste and feel and enjoy in much the same way we do now, yet we won't be doing so in a fallen creation. Right? So, so Paul says, look, the God, the Spirit, who, who, who raised Jesus mortally from the grave will do the same for us. So that is an eschatological hope. That is a hope that we have for the end of the world. Yes, and it may it come quickly, our resurrected bodies. At the same time, we err in thinking that the hope of salvation is still future. Look, I'm saved now. I got my fire insurance so that when I stand on the day of judgment, um, I won't go to hell. Right? I'll go to heaven. If that's all the gospel is, then you're robbing yourself of the fruit of the gospel. I believe Paul here is talking more than just our hope after we die. He's also talking about the hope now that we are alive. Because throughout this, this, this epistle, he describes those living in sin as dead. It's the dead works that we saw in chapter 6. And that what sin did, does is, 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 it, is it kills us. He'll use the same language, for example, in Ephesians chapter 2, that, that, um, that, that, that's, that we were risen from the dead, we're, you know, uh, not literally, but spiritually. And so, so death is often described in spiritual terms to describe our life living in sin apart from Christ. Thus, that means that those who are in Christ truly live. Truly live. And so when we think of eternal life, yes, we should think of the joy and the peace and the love and the happiness and the contentment and all of that that we, we long for there. In a very real sense, that is ours now. This is why the book of Philippians is about joy in the present, not just joy in the future. That's why the Bible talks about love, not just in the love of God we'll experience in the future, but the love of God that we can have now. The peace of God that we saw in chapter 5 is something that we can have now, not just something that we wait for later. The God who raised Jesus from the dead, so he raises us from the dead. And we can enjoy living in Christ. Well, the gospel also makes us sons. I told you, it's right in the middle, verses 14 through 17, I think is really the key idea of, of chapter 8. He says, verse 14, For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you received the spirit of adoptions as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The word Abba is often said to mean, that's an Aramaic word to mean Daddy. Um, and so what you see here is that through the doctrine of adoption, we've been orphaned by sin, abandoned by our, 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 our would-be fathers, um, and it is God who stoops down in the person of Christ wraps us in his arms and draws us into his family so that we are children of God, joint heirs with Jesus. And that, that connection and love is so close that we refer to God as Abba, Father, as Daddy. Have, have you ever really considered the fact that we refer to the God of the cosmos as Father? And you can already see how he's connecting this, this idea of adoption with what he's already discussed. And so he says, we haven't received the, the, a spirit of slavery, and in the spirit of slavery we fall back to fear. And the world of religion is, is driven by fear because how do you know you've done enough? Or the spirit of, of slavery is, is seen in libertarianism, right? Um, but, but we haven't been given the spirit of slavery which leads to fear. Rather, we've been given the spirit of adoptions to fall into sonship. So that when suffering comes, when uncertainty comes, when questions arise, where do we begin? Abba, Father. You see then how these first two themes of freedom and, and life come together in the doctrine of adoption. We were good as dead as orphans, but now he's made us alive as sons so that we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And this bleeds right into verses 18 to 25 where he talks about how the gospel gives us hope. Verse 18, For I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. It's another verse worth meditating on and highlighting in your Bible. The sufferings we have now pale in comparison to what awaits us in glory in the next life. Thus we live with 
hope. And to illustrate that, he talks about how the creation groans. He, he, they, it, it groans uh, for, for redemption. So too, we, do we not now groan for this redemption? He says, uh, verse 23, that, that, that uh, we, like creation, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoptions as sons. Now, he just said we are adopted, but now he says we will be adopted. In the Bible, that's typical. It'll talk about our salvation as past, present, and future. We have been saved. We are being saved. We will be saved. So, too, we have been adopted. We will be adopted. Why? why? And, and that, is, that is so important for us, not just reading the Bible, but to think theologically about these things. He says that our adoptions as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. That's been the struggle with the pandemic, isn't it? That we, we, we're having to learn patience all over again. Um, but, 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 through, but our hope is bigger than, than waiting to go out to eat again. Our hope is final redemption of our bodies, our adoption as sons, and a renewed heaven and earth. We hope for that. We long for that. And in that hope, we believe that the world that awaits us is better than the world we live in. Thus, we can persevere with patience in this world. So we love our neighbor. We tell others about Jesus. And we overcome the obstacles because what awaits us is greater than what we have. We live in that hope. After all, as sons and daughters of God, He will not abandon us. I want to look at one last thing, and I've probably gone too long, but chapter 8 is, is a long chapter, yes, but it's, it's, it's a key chapter in the book of Romans. So not only do, does the gospel um, set us free, makes us alive, makes us sons, and gives us hope, it secures us in love. Notice verse 26, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us groanings too deep for words. Here again we see the ministry of the Spirit. And here the Spirit not only adoptions us, adopts us as sons and gives us life, the Spirit intercedes on our behalf. And Paul is talking about suffering here. And he says there are times of suffering when, when we don't have words. We, we, we are dumbfounded. I, I bet maybe, maybe you've been there. Maybe you are there. Maybe this, this whole pandemic has been part of that story. We're, 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 you, you lack the words to express burden on your soul. And Paul says, look, if, if you would cry out to God, Abba, Father, His Spirit will take care of the rest. Maybe the best prayer you can have for one right now is one that doesn't include words, but a broken heart healed by God. He, he, he says it again in, in verse 27, that the Spirit intercedes for the saints. And all of this is because of the work of the gospel driven by the love of God. You'll see it down there starting in verse 31. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Right, and so starting in verse 31 is a series of questions. Who can be against us? Um, and then verse uh, 33, who can bring a charge against us? Verse 34, who can condemn? Verse 35, who can separate us from the love of God? And his answer to all of them is no one can. And he gives a theological reason, and, and we'll look at those, but don't miss the answer. Who can condemn us? Who can separate us? Who, 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 who can do all of these things? The answer is no one can. So who can, um, who, who is against us? Well, if, if, if God did not spare his own son, but gave his son up for us, how will he not also graciously give us all things? Like hope, like life like freedom, like joy, like the gospel. Who could bring a charge against us? It's God who justifies. Who, who, who can condemn us? Christ Jesus is, is, is the one who died and was raised. He's at the right hand of, of God and is interceding on our behalf. And remember the first verse of this chapter. There is now no condemnation if you are in Christ Jesus. And who can separate us from the love of God? Can tribulation do that? Can distress, can persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, sword, pandemic? The answer no one can. In fact, he says, verse 37, And all these things were more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, angels nor rulers, things present or things to come, powers, height, depth, 
anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of Christ. That's the good news of the gospel, isn't it? Yes, the gospel makes us alive. Yes, the gospel gives us freedom. Yes, the gospel gives us hope. Yes, the gospel makes us sons. At the end of the day, we are secure in the love of Jesus, whether things are going great or things are going sour, whether we're amid pandemic or whether we're amid economic, uh, um, uh, uh, where just things are going great. Nothing in this world can separate us from the love of Christ if we would but run to him in this time of need. Will you not do that? And in so doing, we become adopted sons and daughters of God. Because we cry out to him, Abba, Father, despite our circumstances. Lord willing, we'll see you guys here tomorrow uh, for Romans chapter 9. Uh, chapters 9, 10, 11 are, are the most difficult portions of the book. But I think you'll find uh, some, real, um, uh, some real goodness in those. See you tomorrow.